All right, all right, go ahead and I, I love, I love to love to see the body of Christ come together like this and you guys greeting one another, loving on one another, what a beautiful thing it is. If you are not a part of this family, but you're here today, listen, now you're a part of this family. It's a family of believers and man, how fun it is to come together and worship and to grow and learn. Let me ask, are you happy to be here today? Yeah, me too, me too. And uh, just right from the start, I, I know that this is break week and we have a lot of people traveling out there on vacation somewhere, which makes us in here very jealous of you out there. Um, but welcome those who are joining us online this morning. Glad you can make it wherever it is that you are watching from. Also, we want to welcome our chapel who is joining us by video this morning. Welcome the chapel. People wave to them and just say, hey, all right? Guys, I want you to grab your Bibles. I want you to grab a pen, grab your notes, get ready to write a few things down here this morning as we continue our study. Our series, it's called Love is a Battlefield. Uh, real quick, if you got your Bible, let me see it. Raise your, raise your Bible up. Some of you can put your phone up or your, your iPad up. And, and like we always say, if you, we, you listen, listen, we need to be in God's Word. It's so very important that we are all in God's Word. If you do not have a Bible at home, there might be a Bible in the seat in front of you. You can grab that Bible, take that Bible, let that Bible be a gift from community to you. And as I always say, if you're one of those people who have 10 of our Bibles at your house, bring them back and quit stealing from the church, okay? Yeah. But no, it's so important that we're here in God's Word. Again, we go to the book of Ephesians today, okay? So go there. And let's begin with a word of prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, oh, yeah. Oh, wow. To be able to call you Father. Father, I, I pray that that in itself would sink in this morning. As we're talking about being fathers, being mothers to children, how important that is, let us know how amazing it is that you let us call you Father. May we this morning see your heart, know your heart, and be moved by your heart for each one of your children. Father, do in us the work, the work that needs to be done so that we can be people that stand in the gap here in this time, in this culture, in this world in which we live. Father, we ask that you would turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. Father, may your spirit move in this place today. May you speak and may we listen. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Today we're talking about the fight, the fight for your kids. Some of you know we've been in this series now several weeks, and it's called Love is a Battlefield. And if you back up to the very first Sunday, you know we went to the end of Ephesians. And in the end of Ephesians, it talked about a spiritual battle that's going on all around us. Paul said, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against the rulers in the darkness. That's where a real struggle, a real battle is at. The enemy is real. And the enemy has brought the fight to us. Last Sunday, we talked about our marriage relationships. And I do believe the enemy loves to attack the marriage relationship. Today, though, we're talking about the fight for our kids. And that, I believe, is the enemy. He loves to bring the fight and hit us where it really hurts with our kids. And so we must fight, put on the spiritual armor, and fight for our kids. In the book of Ezekiel, there's a particular passage, it's in Ezekiel 22, verse 30. And the picture that we're given is that God says, I've been looking, I've been looking, I've been looking for a man to stand in the gap. And if I can't find the man to stand in the gap, 
then you're going to be living in a land that's cursed. What is the gap? The gap is a gap in the wall. And if there's a gap in the wall, then those inside the wall are really not protected. If there's a gap in the wall and nobody stands in the gap, the enemy can come in and do whatever the enemy wants to do. I believe that there is a real gap. There's a gap in the wall. There's a gap in the wall in our homes. There's a gap in the wall and the enemy is able to come in and do with our children what he wants to do, which is why there needs to be someone to stand in the gap. Someone to stand up and say, no, you can't do this. Someone to take a stand. Listen, this morning we're going to notice that it's talking to children and it's talking to mom and dad, but then the Apostle Paul leans, leans really heavy on the father. In a lot of ways this morning, I'm going to lean really heavy on the fathers. You guys know that you can be a male but not be a man? It said God was looking for a man, but he couldn't find one. It, God's looking, and there's certainly a lot of males there, but there's not one man. He can say, this is a man who will stand in the gap. We need some men. We need some fathers who step into the role of fatherhood and take it seriously. Take the responsibility. We need some men to stand in the gap. Those very men that God's looking for. The question this morning is, are we willing to step into that place and into that role and to do what we are called to do? The Apostle Paul in Ephesians 6, verse 1 says this, Children, Obey your parents because you belong to the Lord. Everybody raise your hand if you're a child. Yeah, get them up there. Okay, good. Yeah, that's about everybody, right? <laughs> Children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord, for this is the right thing to do. Honor your father and your mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you and you will have a long life on the earth. And then there's this, fathers. Raise your hand if you're a father. Raise your hand if you're a grandfather. Raise your hand if you're a mother. Raise your hand if you're a grandmother. Fathers. Do not provoke your children to anger by the way that you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. I want you to go back and circle that. Bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. It's important. It's something we can't miss. It's something that we must do. Just from this passage of Scripture, we find some must some important things that we can't miss. It's what I'm going to call this morning four imperatives for our homes and for our families and for fighting for our kids. I've been told all my life that when I was a little baby and I was put into the nursery, the lady in the nursery dropped me on my head. And some of you are like, oh, now that explains it right there, right? Yeah, whatever. I don't know what damage it might have done, but one thing I know is you shouldn't drop babies on their head, right? I mean, that's, that's kind of like when you go to a nursery, your main goal, right, is don't drop the baby. But evidently, whoever was taking care of me after they checked me in was was, uh, well, um, maybe a little bit careless. 
maybe, uh, maybe wasn't as careful as she should have been, or maybe she got distracted. Maybe something got her attention, and as a result, she dropped the baby. Why am I telling you this? Because there are some important things that we cannot miss as parents. But in many ways, many of us have dropped the baby. We've gotten distracted by, by this over here in life. And we've made this our priority. And because we got sort of so distracted by this over here, thinking this is what it's all about, well, we kind of dropped the baby. Or maybe we just, uh, we just got a little careless. Maybe, maybe we just got a little, bit, uh, a little bit lazy, you know, kind of kick back on, I don't need to worry about this. I don't need to do any of this. I don't need, to, I don't need, I don't need my family in church. We're good without church. I don't need to read, be studying the Word of God. It will be all right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to consume my time with this over here. And, and so many of us, what happens? Well, we fumble the baby. We fumble the baby. Now, here's the thing. Probably every single one of us in here, who, moms who raise your hands, you dads who raise your hands, even grandparents who you raise your hands, probably every single one of us can think back and go, man, I have messed up as a parent at some place in my life. Can you do that? Falling short, right? This morning, I, I don't want you to walk out of here with, oh, I dropped the baby, man. It's all over for my home and for my family. No, no, please understand. When, when, when you fumble, you simply pick it back up and, and move on. Interesting stat, interesting stat, okay? You can impress your friends with this. How many of you watched Super Bowl last Sunday? Mm -hmm. Did you know Patrick Mahomes set a record? Set a record last Sunday. You probably didn't hear this record that he set, but the record that he set was, well, actually, he ended up tying this record for the most fumbles in Super Bowl games. That's, 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 that's one of the records right there. Most fumbles in the Super Bowl game. But, but do you remember who still won? You remember who still, you remember, you remember he still won? A lot, a lot of tension in here right now, man. Wow. You guys are, whew. Still won. Why did, why did he say, you know what? When he fumbled in the fourth quarter, he could have just said, that's it. It's done, right? It's over. But he didn't stop, did he? I'm telling you, as a parent, there are going to be times when you, when you fumble the baby. I'm telling you, as a grandparent, there are going to be... How many grandparents again? I've always heard that, that, um, that uh, being a grandparent is simply a, a, a reward for not having killed your own kids. <laughs> is that true? Yeah. Okay, all right. But being that grandparent, being that parent, yeah, there are going to be times when we've dropped the ball, dropped the baby, when we fumbled a bit. But you know what? We can start today. We can start today to do what we're called to do, to be who we're called to be. The four imperatives that I call for parents that we find from what we just read here in the book of Ephesians. The first one might surprise you. I want you to write it down. Number one, I must find forgiveness for myself. Find, find forgiveness for myself. Real quick, uh, raise your hand if you've got issues. Yeah. Uh, all of our hands should go up with that, right? In other words, yeah, we've got issues. We've got things that are here that if they're not dealt with, they affect out here. Um, what's here, we can never for a second think that if I keep it here, it won't do anything out here in my home. Now, what, what's going on here affects everything out here in your home and in your family. And if it's not dealt with here, then it's going to do damage out here. Um, maybe you've heard... And a lot of people have referred to this. Exodus chapter 34, verse 7. Uh, it's what a lot of people might call a generational curse. Have you heard of a generational curse? 
generational curse basically goes like this, that the sins of the fathers will be carried on to the third and the fourth generation. And that's what you might call a generational curse. In other words, it happened back there, and because it's back there, then it's going to happen again and again and again and passed on from generation to generation. And there are a lot of people who live like that and even throw up their hands and go, well, that's just who we are. Listen, I've got some good news for you. I've got some, there's, there's a way where that curse doesn't have to get passed on. There's a way where that doesn't have to continue on. How's that way? By entering into a new family. It's by entering into a new, yeah, yeah, there's a generational curse and this can be passed on. And man, some of you are like, I've seen it passed on throughout generation after generation in my home and in my family. And so I've seen it happen. And so I guess we're doomed that it's happened and there's no way for it not to happen, but that's simply not true. In fact, it can stop with you. And it stops when you enter into a new family. The new family is God's family. Where do we find that? It's found in Acts chapter 2. Peter replies, verse 38, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God. Repent of your sins and turn to God. It can't be something that I, I hold on. It can't be something that I hide here. Listen, listen, our, our secret sins are not really secret. Our secret sins are going to seep out. Instead, they have to be dealt with. For instance, if I harbor bitterness here and I say, no big deal, and you might have a good reason for bitterness. You might be saying, look how I was treated as a kid. Look at what I, I went through. And that bitterness is there. Guess what? If that bitterness is not dealt with, it's, it's like a disease that not only infects you, but it seeps out and affects your whole family. And so it must be dealt with. How, though? He says, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and this promise is to you and to your children and even on past your children, if you continue to read. In other words, it's... It starts here, and it starts here in the forgiveness that you find and the freedom that you find in the Lord Jesus Christ. It, it starts with a relationship with Jesus Christ, and that relationship with Jesus Christ means that when you put your faith and trust in him and you find forgiveness of your sins, you become a part of God's family, adopted, and we're going to see here in just a moment, adopted into the family of God. And now you've got a new generational thing happening. Rather than that generational curse, now you've got an inheritance from your heavenly Father. And all the blessings that are found in the family of God. But it has to start here. It has to start here. And that forgiveness is total, and that forgiveness is complete. That forgiveness is able to cover that love that covers a multitude of sin, no matter what. And so from that, you can take hope in that there is hope for my home and there is hope for my family because now I am in the family of God. And that's what gets passed on. Um, there's something that I call... Spiritual life insurance. And let me, let me explain to you what, how many, how many of you know what life insurance is? You know life insurance? Okay. Uh, several years ago, my daughter was, uh, she got offered to purchase life insurance and she came and asked us and said, should, should I purchase life insurance? And uh, uh, she said, uh, you know, I could purchase life insurance and, and y'all, because I, I don't have a family, would be my beneficiaries. And she says, should I get that? And I said, I said, no, no, no. I, um, listen, you don't need to buy life insurance. And she goes, well, why not? And I said, I said because um, uh, if you died, um, me and your mom would be okay. And I meant to say financially. <laughs> <laughs> I 
well, she goes, what? I, no, no, baby, no, baby, no, no. We would be so sad. No, we would not be okay. But we would be okay financially, and so we don't actually need that life insurance money uh, for, from you. And she goes, well, what about you guys? Do you all have life insurance? And, and uh, we said, yeah, we have life insurance. And, and uh, she looked at my wife, and she said um, to Kim, she said, okay, so if daddy dies, then what happens? And I, I'm telling you guys the truth. My wife in that moment says, beach house, whoop, whoop. <laughs> She, she, she was joking, <laughs> I think. <laughs> but, but what is life, life, life insurance is, is after you're gone, the blessings keep going. And that's why I say, have you invested in some spiritual life insurance for your family? To where after you're gone, after you are long gone, they're still going, man, you know what? I'm going through a hard time right now, but what I remember is, I, I, remember, I remember my dad when, when he'd go through a hard time, he, he, he'd still, he, he had such faith. And he'd be trusting in the Lord, even through that tough time. And so maybe that's what I can do now too. Spiritual life insurance is, is, is that, that, that grandchild, um, when, 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 they're, when they, they get a little older and they're faced with this or with that, and suddenly they're going, you know what, my grandmom used to always drag me to church. I never wanted to go, but she made sure I was there and she drug me to church. And now when, because what I'm going through in life right now, I, you know what, maybe I need to be back in church. Maybe I need to seek God. That's spiritual life insurance, you know. You know, spiritual life insurance is, is, uh, is, is that long after you're gone, there's that, there's that legacy of, I didn't know where to go or where to turn, but my mama was, was a prayer warrior. My mama was a prayer warrior. That's one thing I remember. And through all the stuff I went through, all the ups and the downs and all the stuff I put her through, you know what? She, she stayed on her knees and she kept praying for me and she did not stop. She did not quit. And maybe, maybe just now, maybe that's, that's where I find the answer is when I, when I fall on my knees and seek the Lord. That's, that's what I call spiritual life. And he says, it's for you, this gift but it's not just a gift for you, it's, it's a gift also for your kids. And it's something that can carry on long after. But it starts here, it starts here. To find first that forgiveness for myself, and in that forgiveness that I find for myself, what it, what it, what it shows me, it begins to show me the incredible love in the heart of the Father. And that changes everything. What are we talking about? The second thing you need to write down is this, number two. Focus on my fellowship with my father. Now, understand, I, I, I don't want us to take that word father lightly. Do you know in the Old Testament, um, the word father for, for God is used rarely, very rarely. You don't see it much. There's, there's a, one in Isaiah and one, they're, they're, it's very rarely used in the Old Testament. Instead, God, uh, throughout the Old Testament, it, it seems there's to be more distance. You can't go into the Holy of Holies, right? Um, you, you stand in reverence and in awe of God, and, uh, and certainly we should. But then when we get to the New Testament, it's like the New Testament just explodes with God as our Father. Uh, you remember, uh, and it's all because of Jesus here. It's all because of Jesus and what Jesus has done. He's made a way where we are adopted into the family of God. He's made a way where we can be called sons and daughters of the living God. He's, he, Jesus says, uh, when, when we pray, 
Do it this way. Our Father. It's Jesus who said, guys, why are you worried about everything? I mean, you're worried about this and you're worried about that and the, the stuff you're going to wear and the food you're going to eat. He says, don't you know that your Father in heaven knows everything that you need? And he, 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 he clothes the flowers of the field. He feeds the birds. That's the kind of Father that you have. In the book of Hebrews, it says that we can come boldly into the throne room of God. Why? Because we're his children. Focus on my fellowship with my father. What are we talking about here? Do you have, do you have your relationships in the right priority? What, what is first? Is your fellowship, is your relationship with God, your Father, first and foremost? Or have, have some other relationships in your life crept to that number one spot? And if another relationship has crept to that number one spot, what that means is that other relationship is actually a God in place of God. And parents, listen, I know you love those babies. I know you love those babies so much. And you've got such big plans for those babies. And you've got these big dreams for those babies. But if those babies ever get into that number one place, those children actually become your God. And children make terrible gods. (laughs) And any relationship that takes priority over God becomes a false God. Is he your first, is he your foremost? Ephesians 1, 3, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. Mama birds. You know what mama birds do? When mama birds have little babies in the nest, the mama bird will go out and find some food. And the mama bird will actually eat the food or swallow the food and start to digest the food. And then when she gets back where her babies are at, she'll regurgitate the food. And that's where she feeds those little babies. Sounds disgusting, right? Well, that's what a mama bird does. She, she first has it for herself and that makes it good for her, her baby. And what I'm trying to say is we first must have it for ourselves. We must be digesting it. We must must consume it. We must must read it. We must know it, meditate on it. It must become real in our lives before we can then go feed it to our children. Uh, my wife, my, my kids call, and they're having car trouble. You, who, who do you think in my, in my family they call? Huh? My wife, you're right, they do. Uh, they don't call dad, they bypass dad. Uh, car trouble, can't figure this out with my car, I'm going to call mom. I, I don't mind admitting that. My wife knows more about cars than I do, you know? I can, I can lift up a hood when something's broken and kind of stand there and Yeah, I don't know much. But my wife will come out and say, oh, that sounds like the carburetor is doing, I don't know, what? How do you know this? I know how she knows it. You know how she knows it? Because her dad was a mechanic. And there will be those days when we'd be out there sitting in the driveway, working on the car, and 
and his little girl would be out there playing around him and sitting on the, the hood and asking, what are you doing and what's this and what's that and learning all about cars. Why? Because she was, she, her, her dad was a mechanic and she would simply spend time with a mechanic. In the same way, in the same way, you and I, when we focus on our relationship with our Father, when we spend time with Him, you know what He does? He he starts to make us more and more into the image of His Son, Jesus Christ. We become more like Christ. What what He's doing is he's, He's filling us up. He's satisfying us with those needs that each one of us has, the needs for a true Father, the heavenly Father, the real Father, above all else. And when, when He changes us and He fills us up like that, guess what? It's, on th- it's then and only then that we have something good to give to our kids. Are you being satisfied with the goodness of your heavenly Father? Focus on my fellowship with my father. Number three, then, is to follow God's parental lead. Follow God's parental lead. Ephesians 5, 1, imitate God, therefore, in everything that you do, because you are his dear children. Parents, have you found out that your kids are not only, they're not really going to do what you say, but they're going to do what you do? In the same way, imitate God, therefore, in everything you do because you are his dear children. And we see what God does and we see how God acts and we can do what God does. We follow God's parental lead and God is such, such a wonderful parent to you and I. I was, uh, I was driving yesterday down the highway and uh, starting to get off of the highway there. And uh, uh, at one particular exit, when I, when I was getting off of the exit, I noticed there was a guy who had his, had his blinker on in front of me. And uh, he had, his blinker was showing left, but he was turning right. You ever get behind somebody like that? They're confusing, aren't they? Huh? Uh, they're, they, they, they're saying I'm going left, but the truth is they're, they're going right. And it confuses everybody around them. Parents, you can't tell your kids you're going left and go right. Fathers, we can't, we can't be indicating we're going left and go right. The kids watch, they see, they pick up. I want to take you back to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. I had you underline something. Remember what it was? It says, rather... Bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. Before that, it was don't provoke your children to anger by the way that you treat them. How, do, how is it that we provoke our children to anger? Oftentimes, it's simply because we sit over here and we say, you go do this, and we don't do it ourselves. We give instruction by our mouths, but not direction by our actions. Don't provoke your children to anger by the way that you treat them. Rather, and then there's these three little words. What are those next three words? Bring them up. Have you noticed that we can't bring somebody up unless we are first going there with them ourselves? Bring them. He didn't say tell them to go up. He says, bring them up. Show them. Live it out. Um, I'm going to give you some key words to remember real quick, okay? Key words. I think there's a place for it on your your outline. And uh, don't get these out of order, okay? Don't get these out of order. Key words to remember. The first one, affection. Affection. Are you affectionate to your children? Do you, do you say it and spray it? Are you continually showing affection to that child? Because if you don't show affection, if you withhold affection and you start off with number two, which is direction, 
direction. And then number three, correction. Affection, direction, correction. If you start off with correction and there is no affection, you're going to have bitter kids. You're going to provoke them to anger. Or if it's always only about direction and there is no affection, there's no re- they won't listen. They won't listen. They have to know that you love them. Your heavenly Father, this is how we know what love is. Christ died for us while we were still sinners. In other words, there's this tremendous amount of love that has been shown to us. God, our heavenly Father, shows love, his affection for you and I. But then there's also direction. When you show affection, then you can give direction. Direction that is needed, direction that is necessary to be able to lead, to be able to guide where it is that they must go. I want to tell you one of the, one of the scariest times of my life. You know what it was? When I was trying to teach my son how to drive a stick shift. <laughs> Whoo, man. Had this Jeep, and, and I had him in there, and we'd been practicing a little bit, and, and sat down. And that's a scary thing to sit down in, in the passenger seat. And, and, and I'm, he's over there, and I'm, I'm instructing him, I'm telling him what to do. You've got to slowly let off on the clutch, give it a little bit of gas, put, make sure you've gotten in first gear, and, and, and then when you do that, and you're trying not to stall it, and, and we're going down Jodico Road right here, and, and, and we're stalling it out, and people are honking their horns, and, and he's, he's flipping, and I'm sweating like you would not believe, man. It's a scary, scary thing, but, but, but it was something that must be done, Right? Parents, it's not always fun to give direction or discipline to your kids, is it? But I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to challenge you. Win those battles early. Win those battles early. The earlier the better. Because if you, if you don't, if you don't give direction and if there is no correction when they're young, it's going to be that much worse when they're older. Scripture says, train up a child in the way they should go. And when they are old, they will not depart from it. Train up a child in the way they should go. Give that direction. And and as you're giving that direction, every once in a while, there will have to be that correction. And we're we're like, man, no, I I don't like the tough parts of, of parenting like that correction. But, oh, no, no, no. Don't you understand? Don't you know? That the parent who gives the correction is actually the parent who really loves the child. And the parent who would withhold any type of discipline or correction is the one who, I don't care what happens to them when they get older. It says here, Hebrews 12, 6, it's the child that he loves that he disciplines. The child he embraces, he also corrects. Follow God's parental lead. God loves you. God loves you so much that he will not let you continue on in something that is going to hurt you without the correction that is needed for you as his dear child. What is the, what is the outcome? What, what is the goal? It's, it's maturity. It's growing. Hey, parents, everybody do this. Um, put, your, put, your, uh, put your hands out like this, Okay. It's like this. All right. The goal of parents, the goal of, of, of parent, parenting is this. You ready? Get them grown. Repeat after me. Get them grown and get them gone. <laughs> there you go. Okay? Mm-hmm. Enabling them. The, the maturity that is need, need. Because the truth is you won't always be there to bail them out. You know, it won't always be around to fix that problem. But it's that correction that's all about that, bringing about that maturity in them that God does for us as children, but he also, for, for us to do for our own children, to get them grown, to get them gone, to be spiritually mature. And then finally, number four, 
So what do we have? Find forgiveness for myself. Focus on fellowship with my father first. Follow God's parental lead. And then number four, find ways to fully demonstrate God's love to my family. Find ways to fully demonstrate God's love to my family. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Um, I might do one. But uh, in a moment, there's a whole new class. Uh, It's called the Five Love Languages. We talked about it last Sunday um, for marriage, but it's not just for marriage. Uh, One of the ways you can love your child is understanding what their love language is and communicating that love language to that child. And so uh, I would encourage all parents, uh, if you've not done, go, go to that class. You can go to that class today, jump on in there, and, uh, and you can be learning some of those love languages, not just for your spouse, but also for that child as well. But uh, find ways to fully demonstrate God's love to my family. First John 3, 18, dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. By the way, you know how so many children often spell love? T-I-M-E. Time. Find ways to fully demonstrate God's love to my family. Pastor Neil was telling me about an interview. I ended up looking up the interview. I thought uh, it was pretty interesting. Um, How many of you remember uh, Bo Jackson? Remember Bo Bo Jackson? Remember the commercials, huh? Bo knows? Can't tell you guys how many times I heard that in my life. (laughs) But uh, man, what an incredible athlete this guy was. Some of you might remember, not only did he play football for the NFL, but he also played baseball, right? Remember that? Yeah, Major League Baseball player too, uh, which is why they kept saying Bo knows everything regarding sports. Some of you might remember where he could take a bat and break it across his knee like that. Remember that? But it was interesting, in an interview, Bo Jackson was asked, what was your favorite sports memory? And when he's asked, what is your favorite sports memory, uh, he doesn't hesitate. He said, it was, it was this one game. He goes, my wife had just given birth to my, my daughter, Morgan, in the hospital. He goes, I go to the game that evening. He goes, I get up there at, at, at bat. He goes, and I simply watch three strikes go by. He said, and then I, I, I turn to the ump and I, I say a few choice things to him. So much so that finally he kicks me out of the game. He goes, when he did that, I turned to him, I said, thank you. And he said, he runs back, doesn't even shower, runs back and, and gets his stuff, jumps in his car. And as he's driving towards the hospital, he talks to his wife and his wife says, on your way here, I want you to stop and get me some Popeye's chicken. He said, so he stops and he gets the Popeye's chicken and, and he goes, he gets out of his car and he's walking down the street towards the hospital and uh, it, it, he happens to see a car coming uh, in, in, in the other direction and, and there's this big puddle and when the car approaches, he says, the car speeds up and hits that water and sprays him. He goes, but he said, I had the wherewithal to protect the chicken. And he says, he goes, uh, he goes into the hospital and he, he has to change in, into some scrubs because he was soaking wet. He goes, and then he goes, he goes, I pulled the bassinet over next to the bed and I climbed in the bed and hugged my wife. And together we watched the rest of the baseball game. He said, that's my favorite sports memory. Guys, we got to know what the real priority is. We got we got to know we got we got to know what's trivial and what's not trivial. We got to know what really matters regarding our homes and regarding our families. The last verse in the Old Testament, Malachi. It says this, it said, before the great day of the Lord, he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. 
or else a curse will strike the land. May God turn all our hearts back home to our families. May we have hearts that are willing to do battle, stand in the gap for our homes, for our families, for our children. May God raise us up to do just that. Let's bow in a word of prayer. I said it all begins first, first, with finding forgiveness for yourself. In other words, it begins with entering into a relationship with Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sin, for an eternity in heaven, for becoming a child of God forever and ever and ever. Friend, if you have never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, please hear now in this moment today, right where you sit quietly in your own mind, you can pray a prayer, you can call out to him. He hears you, he knows your thoughts. Maybe, maybe say something like this, say, Jesus, I do believe that you died for me on the cross. And I'm asking you to forgive me of my sin. Come into my life and be my God and my Savior and my, my best friend forever and ever. Jesus, save me. Friend, when you pray that and you mean it with your heart, you can know that you have eternal life. Best decision you will have ever made. You are a child of God, and that can never be taken away from you. Father, I thank you for those who just prayed that here this morning, who have found salvation through your son, Jesus Christ, who have found themselves in your family. Thank you for that. Father, we ask that you would raise up men and women, parents, grandparents, with a heart like your own. Help us to stand in the gap. Help us to fight for our children, for our families. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen.